Hello everybody, I'm Mr. Wildcat. Hope you all having a wonderful day today. And welcome to another special review of Married Children. This episode is being dropped um, about 24 hours before Thanksgiving, an official holiday here in the United States. To all, So to all of you American viewers, happy Thanksgiving. Stuff up on turkey and all the side dishes you can. And don't forget to save room for that pumpkin pie. And then when you're all done, stuff in your face J feast your eyes on all of those rivalry college football games that are going to be playing throughout the entire weekend you will not be disappointed there are three particular games that I am uh, being looking forward to in college football this weekend we have the Territorial Cup game on Friday on Black Friday Arizona and Arizona State that's my rivalry game and then another game to be looked out for is Ohio State and Michigan and then we have USC and Notre Dame. Those games do not disappoint. And I highly encourage you guys to go check them out, plus every other game in between. Okay. Now, we're probably wondering, are we reviewing the Thanksgiving episode for Married Children? No, we're not. Um, the reason why we're not reviewing it today is because we've already reviewed it back in, about three months ago. Mr. Wildcat review has vowed to review season 11 at the same time that the Married Children podcast reviews it. And the Bundy Thanksgiving episode happened to have fallen on the They do it in the order of when the episodes originally aired on Fox back in 96, 97. And Bundy Thanksgiving just happened to have fallen on the schedule back in August. So it's already reviewed. Go check it out on my channel. And for those of you who have not listened to the review of the Married Children podcast, go check that one out too. I'll post the link on my description video here. They land a perfect guest host. You have, um, there's a guy out there who runs a podcast for WKRP in Cincinnati, a show which produced one of the most infamous Thanksgiving episodes of all time. So they got a wonderful story to share. You do not want to miss it, okay? So enough of Thanksgiving. I do have a couple other announcements, but I'll share them for the end because I know you guys want to get into what I have to review today. Today we are going to review Birthday Boy Toy, okay? The next episode on our schedule for Season 11. This episode is the, ni is the 19th episode to be produced and the 19th episode to air from season 11. So this one fell right on the schedule. Um, it was taped on February 14th, 1997 and originally aired on March 31st, 1997. Now, one thing to be on the lookout for in regards to, okay, birthday boy toy. So um, after this episode, okay, there's only like five more episodes. So Married Children takes a couple weeks off, then they're going to do or two epi then they wind up airing two episodes back to back, which are Damn Bundies and Lesby Friends. We will be reviewing those episodes separately, of course, because they're not related to each other in one way or another. Then they take, I think, and then the following week they have the two part uh, season finale, the finale that they originally wrote for, that was supposed to originally end season 11, which were Desperate Half Hour and How to Marry a Moron. And then we have, and they, when I'm going on break for a couple more weeks before airing the last ever episode, the Chicago Shoe Exchange. So that's all we have left. And that's the Mary Children Podcast and Mr. Wildcat. We both are on schedule to finish season 11 by the end of December of 2022. So be on the lookout for those. Okay. So um, Birthday Boy Toy, very crazy episode. And I... I actually liked it pretty much. I'm not going to, sh I'll share more from my review at the end. But basically, we start the episode off. Peggy's on the couch watching TV. Peggy, I mean, Kelly, she co comes down the stairwell with a busted piggy bank. All right. And basically, Peggy has broken into Peggy, Peggy's broken into Kelly's piggy bank so that she can do some home shopping. All right, Peggy has turned into a home shopaholic, and she's gone as far as stealing from the kids. 
She busted Kelly's piggy bank wide open, but Kelly doesn't seem like Peggy's the one who stole it, but the one who knows who stole it, okay? Because inside the piggy bank, red hair do, there's some red hairs and some bonbon wrappers, okay? Kelly, the stupidest bitch on the face of the earth, cannot seem to put two and two together and cannot seem to figure out that Peggy's the one who stole out of her piggy bank. But no. Kelly demands answers. Who stole from who stole my money? Then Peggy winds up showing Kelly something shiny that she had purchased from QBC. It's a bribe for Kelly. Alright? One or the other. Okay. Then Al comes in the house with a big pile full of mail, all of whom are bills from Peggy's spending. All right. I hope you have, I hope one of these bills is for a coffin because your home shopping is killing me. And guess what? Peggy bought something for Al too, another bribe. It's one of these little pictures. You tilt it one way, it looks like Ginger, Marianne. Ginger, Marianne. From Gilligan's Island, of course. But Al's not buying it. Okay? It's bad enough that Peggy is uh, doing a shitload of buying off of QVC. She's also gone out and bought herself a Sam's Club membership. No, no, no. <laughs> Ah, health club membership. There is a difference, you know. She went out and bought herself a membership to a health club so she can keep herself fit and attractive to Al. How am I supposed to look fit and attractive for you? Buy a time machine. That's it, Peggy. I'm cutting off your spending. Give me the credit cards now. Cal um, Peggy goes down into her dress, pulls the credit card out of her boobs puts it in Al's hand, and then Lucky has another credit card, okay? Basically, um, Peggy had given Lucky one of the credit cards for safekeeping as a backup credit card in the case that Al winds up confiscating her cards. But, of course, Lucky, being afraid of what Al would do to him, He's a nice boy, and he surrenders the credit card. And, of course, Peggy's upset. Traitor! Oh, Al, please don't make me stop spending. My life would be ruined. That almost makes us even. So now Peggy is banned from doing any more home shopping off the TV. All right? Then we go to the shoe store. Where Al and Griff are building a shoe house out of shoe boxes. All right, they got it just about done, except for uh, except for the roof. There's like one or two parts on the roof that have to be done with the lids to them, and basically they put them on in their place, and the whole shoe box house comes falling apart. Somebody's got to clean that up. But, of course, Al and Griff are too lazy for it. Then Al and Kelly, Bud and Kelly, they come into the shoe store. Gary has apparently hired. She has apparently hired um, Bud and Kelly for a shoe store commercial that she wants done for to promote her shoe store to all the customers and basically they picked Bud and Kelly because Gary wanted somebody fast and cheap which explains the actress Kelly Kelly is the actress Bud's the director they have the setting for the shoe store now they just gotta figure out who's gonna play the shoe salesman and the roles are open to, and they're basically uh, allowing Al and Griff to both audition for the part. 
So, you have Al. He claims to be the a big shoe, a big, the greatest shoe salesman ever, which is bullshit. And then he's also uh, talks about how he's a great actor, where he gives out these seizures um, at IHOP, where he cheats um, IHOP out of a couple of Rudy Tooty Fruity Tooty breakfasts. Okay. Meanwhile, Griff has an intelligent resume. He played Glenda the Good Wit. Okay. He plays Glenda the Good Witch in his high school performance of The Wizard of Oz. And <laughs> Al, being the biggest hypocrite on the face of the earth, he basically talks about, okay, ah, look at you, Griff, you glorifying to your old high school days. Um, Al, what the fuck do you think you've been doing for the last 25 years? That's all we've been hearing you about the entire show's run. How you score four touchdowns in a single game for the Pokai Championship game. Alright. Bud's not uh, buying any of Alan Griff's stories, but he allows them both to try out for the part. Then, but Al, being desperate as he is, he goes up to Bud, pinches him in the ear so tight Okay, he demands that part. Okay, so he basically squeezes Bud right in the ears until Bud has the part. I think we found our actor. Okay, so that's how Al gets hired. Meanwhile, we have Jefferson who came in the shoe store. And basically, he spends all day at the tanning salon. Um, basically, um, trying to look young and attractive. And it's revealed that Jefferson is turning 40 years old. Al and Griff are basically sitting there taunting Jefferson about how, about 40 is all, it's, and once you have 40, it's all downhill from there. I'm going to tell you something, guys. All right. When I turned, when I was in college and I turned 21, I had a uh, my uh, one of my managers, um, Jennifer Wickham, who was one of my desk managers when I worked the desk over at Coronado Hall, my junior year of college. She basically told me, once you turn 21, it's all downhill from there, and in a way, it's right, because okay. Once you hit 13, you can go to a PG-13 movie without having to be accompanied by a parent or guardian. Once you hit 16, you can start driving a car. Once you hit 17, you can go to an R-rated movie without being accompanied by a parent or guardian. Once you hit 18, you're a legal adult. You can vote. You can go fight for, uh, for us in the war. You can... Smoke cig. I think you can smoke cigarettes at 18, but I don't recommend it. Okay. 21 is the granddaddy of them all. You can drink alcohol. You can also buy lottery tickets and go gamble at the casino. And there's a, and there's a few others. Okay. A few other milestones. I think 25 is the other major milestone too. Your car insurance goes down. You can actually rent your own car. And you can actually check into a hotel room by yourself. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? But anyway, we go. Jefferson, uh, uh, he storms out of the shoe store after Bud and Kelly start gloating him about ha wishing happy, happy birthday. He basically storms out, and he we see Jefferson back at home, basically pouring this green uh, stuff on his face, and then cucumbers on his eyes while he goes to sleep. He's very concerned about his looks, and he's very concerned about how he's aging, and very worried about Marcy um, losing affection for Jefferson. 
he's afraid that she's going to turn him in for a younger, more attra more attractive guy. Okay? Then Marcy also asks Jefferson what would he like for his birthday. And he hits her. A health club membership. Alright? So they go to sleep. And then we go back to the Bundy household. Peggy is still, she's still allowed to watch QVC, but she's no longer allowed to get on the phone and place any more orders. But basically what's being sold on QVC, you're not going to believe this one, it's a locket. Fit, uh, um, it's a Tom Jones locket, which contains Tom Jones's very own chess hair. Oh, well, that isn't unusual. <laughs> 25 seconds. <laughs> 22 seconds. <laughs> Damn you, Al. So basically, Al has electrified the phone in order to keep Peggy away from making any more phone calls to QVC. And of course, J Peggy needs some help from Jefferson, of course. She calls up Jefferson and asks... Oh, I don't know if she at calls Jefferson or if she um, goes over and asks him. Uh, well, I want you to come over with Mar with Marcy's tool belt. Okay, she's going to take those tools and she's going to de-electrify the phone so that she can start making phone calls again to QVC and the Shop at Home Network. Okay, while she's sitting there working on the phone, Jefferson's um, telling Peggy how concerned he is about Marcy. Uh, she he's afraid that Marcy's going to walk out on him. And go find herself a more younger, attractive guy. He's afraid he's losing his looks. Okay. Mar Once uh, Peggy gets the phone to de electrified, she has a salute. She has an, an idea. Why don't you spend all of Marcy's money? Then she won't be able to afford to turn you in. Okay. Just a lame excuse to get her hands on that credit card and start making calls again. But basically, Jefferson has a he has one of Marcy's platinum credit cards hiding in his wallet. And when she finds out, she rips the pocket literally and goes to a wallet and gets that credit card. Mommy's back, baby. There's basically no limit on the credit card so she can spend all that she wants. She's basically going to grab that phone. She ties it around Jefferson's arm so that, okay, because she does not want uh, him to stop making calls. And then they start the dialing and making purchases. Meanwhile, back at the shoe store, we have uh, Bud and Kelly. They're trying to shoot the shoe commercial with Al. And basically... Um, it doesn't go too well. So we're about 27, 28 takes, okay? Kelly is basically saying, Excuse me, sir. Do you have any purple? The, basically, the commercial is supposed to say this. Excuse me, sir. Do you have any purple pumps? Certainly, we have purple pumps. At Gary's Shoes, we treat your feet. All right, and of course Al gets it all messed up. All right. Excuse me, sir. Do you have any purple pumps? Certainly, we have purple pimps. At Gary's Shoes, we feed your treat. <laughs> okay. He said all the right words, but in the wrong places. Okay. So they try to do it again, and unfortunately. Al being excited, he basically talks in a very loud, Certainly we do have purple pimps. Right? Oh my god. Okay. Kelly decides to uh, pull Al to the side, try to salvage out whatever's left of him, and unfortunately, it's not working out. Kelly words to Bud, Can his ass. Okay. Bud and Kelly have had enough. So after 29 takes, 
Bud and Kelly both decide to fire Al. And Al can't seem to, like, he wants to continue shooting the commercial. And he, is like, he basically, now Bud is trying to tell Al that he's fired. Oh, I'm fired up, ready to go. You're done. Oh, strange fight. It's over. Strange fight's over. Let's keep moving. Okay. Listen to me. You're fired. You're out. Finish. You must flee TV. Wow, that came out of nowhere. Why did sudden change of heart? No, no. It's not sudden. Your acting sucks. It sucked when we started. It sucks now. It'll always suck. Well, it's just one person's opinion, isn't it? Meanwhile, you have Kelly and Griff that both say, It sucks. Then there's a bunch of men outside. It sucks. And then there is a, a lady who talks over the loudspeaker uh, to everybody at the mall. Okay, I'm not sure how many malls have this, but this mall has one. Attention shoppers! Al Bundy sucks! Okay. Meanwhile, back at the Bundy house, um, Al and I mean, you have Peggy and Jefferson that have made quite a. They've already made a whole bunch of purchases off of QVC because the box is starting to pile up in the Bundy living room. And they, another item comes up for sale. And Peggy says, Oh, let's not wait for the price. Let's just call in. Please tell me what this is going to do to keep me from leaving Marcy. Is that a liver spot? So Jefferson makes the phone call. And right in the middle of calling, Marcy comes in and catches Peggy red-handed trying to trick his trying to trick her innocent Jefferson into a shop shopaholic. Well, yeah, I might have provided the television and the phone, but he did his own dialing. Jefferson, is this true? Yes. Well, that's it. Your free loan days are over, and you're going to pay back every fucking cent that you've spent on me. How am I going to pay for this? Three words. I love you. Try again. Hop on pop. Get a job! <gasps> Marcy and Jefferson are... I mean, no, Peggy and Jefferson are both about to have heart attacks. Because the three words that they do not want to hear. Get a job. All right? So now Peggy and Jefferson are pretty much screwed. Marcy confiscates her credit card, of course. And they're no longer allowed to do any more home shopping. Let's take a quick break, shall we? Because we're now on commercial break. And we're back. We start the second half at this health club. Peggy uh, bought a membership. She bought a health club membership for, her, and Marcy had apparently bought Jefferson a health club, a membership to the same health club that Peggy belongs to. So they both head off to this um, health club, and Jefferson is sitting there working out while Peggy is sitting there on the side eating a sandwich. Yeah, I can see. I can f feel the workout now. I'm starting to feel the burn. That's heartburn. Listen, Peggy, can you uh, put that sandwich down for one second and try to help me get out of this mess that you got me into? Oh, yeah, like it's my fault that you're not aging well. Okay? There's got to be some kind of job that you're qualified for. Okay? So basically, <laughs> you're seeing me working out here because this is a very important thing here because why, okay, he's basically um, squatted down uh, he, he's been turning his face away from the instructor, and he's working out while talking to Marcy, and uh, while talking with Peggy, that is. I'm sorry. Jefferson's sitting there um, talking to Peggy while he's working out, and then you have uh, all the women that are in the same fitness class. They're so attractive to Jefferson's ass, they basically turn around, and they start working out to Jefferson's ass. And then the male um, workout instructor, he's basically... 
and wow, and twirl, and... All right, fine. Stay fat. So basically the instructor quits. He's so pissed off because none of the females are looking at him, and they're looking at Jefferson. Ooh, now you see where we go here? It opens the door for Jefferson to become a workout instructor for the health club. Yeah. So you see, um, now he's going to start making up that money to pay back Marcy for all that spending that he did on her, like behind her back. All right. But before we can see Jefferson uh, teaching a workout class, we go back to the shoe store where Griff is um, trying to cast his role. Excuse me, sir. Do you have any purple pumps? Why, well, certainly we do it. Well, well, Jefferson, wait, well, Griff is sitting there trying to do his lines. Al is running a vacuum cleaner. He hasn't run a vacuum in 25 years. Dad, we're trying to work here. Well, so am I. Al, you haven't vacuumed in 25 years. Oh, that's a perfect time, isn't it? Well, let's get back to the shooting, shall we? Let's just do it one more time, okay? Okay, fine, fine. Take 32, which is three more than what it took me, by the way. Well, that's because you ruined every one of mine. It's because we it's because we had a couple of accidents. Oh, dropping a light on Griff's head. Freak accident. The fire in the stock room. Act of God. Rollerblading here. Rollerblading through here with your pants down playing a tuba. Hey, hey, hey what I do on my break is my business. Come on, admit it, Dad. You're trying to sabotage the commercial. Now get the fuck out of here and don't come back until we're finished. All right, you Hollywood types are so touchy. So he goes in the back room and they're trying to do another, they're now doing take 32. Guess what? That take is interrupted by Al flushing the bat toilet in the bathroom. Flush. Excuse me, sir. Flush. <laughs> then we go back to the health club. And apparently Marcy has now shown up, and she has um, run into Peggy. Peggy, what are you doing here? She's sitting there eating the same, eating another sandwich, working out. Okay. Then we have two women that are also members of the health club. Um, the first name, okay, it's a young, okay, I mean, it's a short, skinny white woman, Susan Isaacs, all right? That's her name, all right? And then there's also a big, fat, black woman who, uh, who's, uh, okay. Um, her name is Son Sonia Eddy, and the character's name is Betty, all right? So Susan Isaacs' character, she's just first woman, all right? No official name for her. Sonia Eddy plays Betty, all right? These two ladies, all right, they appeared on, these two I remember from playing minor roles on Seinfeld, all right, Susan Isaacs, all right, she played um, one of Elaine's, back in season seven, she played one of Elaine's neighbors, Judy, who had, um, she wound up having a child the father had just taken off, so it's a bastard child, okay? She told um, Elaine about the circumstances in complete secrecy, and she told Elaine not to share it with anybody. Well, of course, one of Elaine's friends, John Paul, who was in town for the New York, New York Marathon, and he's staying with Elaine, he basically um, runs into Judy. Hi, I'm a friend of Elaine's. Oh, look at that cute little bastard. Judy runs off all pissed off because now everybody knows about the ki the story. And then the landlord, uh, the supervisor, I mean, the super to the apartment, comes up to John Paul. What the hell are you doing harassing my tenants? Oh, calm down, you son of a bitch. I'm just trying to be friendly. Okay, let's go. But I have a race tomorrow. Now, the reason why John Paul was talking like that is because he wound up running into George Costanza. George, who was working for the Yankees at the time, he wound up taking in a couple of business people from Houston and the Houston Astros. 
And this is basically how they talk in Houston. Everybody's either a son of a bitch or a bastard. He tells um, George, and I mean, George winds up telling Jerry Kramer and Jean Paul about this story, and Jean Paul just got to the best of them. So, and then Judy got all pissed off at the lane because, like, hey, I told you about that baby in secrecy. Well, your friend seems to know all about it. And Elaine thinks it was Jerry that told. But apparently it wasn't. Okay? And then the other, Sonia Eddy, she plays Rebecca de Mornay on two episodes of Seinfeld. So she appeared in an, an episode towards the end of season eight called The uh, Muffin Tops. Um, Elaine and her former boss, Mr. Pitt, oh, no, no, Mr. Lippman, right? Mr. Lippman was Elaine's boss back when they were working for Pendant, for Pendant Publishing. And uh, this is a couple of years after Pendant Publishing had gone out of business. And um, Mr. Lippman decided to run up a, a bakery shop that sells just muffin tops. And he decided to uh, make Elaine a partner, going 30%, giving 30% of the profits to Elaine, considering that it was her ideas. All right. But basically, um, they decided they're having a hard time trying to figure out what to do with the muffin stumps, which are the bottom part of the muffin. And uh, Elaine's um, idea was give them to the soup kitchen. Well, Rebecca de Mornay uh, works for the homeless shelter where they've been receiving all these muffin stumps from. They come to the muffin store and say, why are you dropping off these muffin stops? The homeless people don't like them. Where's the, we've never got so many complaints. Where's the top of the muffin? Who ate the rest of this? Why don't you drop off, if you were trying to help, why don't you drop some chicken skins and lobster shells? Okay. Her other episode is towards the end of season nine, the bookstore. She runs, a, she's working in front of a thrift shop. George wind up buying, he was forced to buy this $100 book from the bookstore after being caught taking it into the bathroom with him and now he's trying to find a way to dispose of it. He can't return the book because it's been flagged. He tried selling it to Elaine but that got this thrown because Jerry um, ruined it for him and then now George is trying to sell it off to the thrift store and of course Rebecca turns out to be a former employee from Britano's. Oh wait a second this book has been in the bathroom. It's been flagged. I know that. I used to work at Bertano's. Mister, we're trying to help the homeless here. It's bad enough we have some nut up there trying to strip them to a rickshaw. You get your toilet book out of here, and I won't jump up this counter and punch you in the brain. Here I come. But anyway, going back to mar married children, okay? So we have uh, custom woman one, okay? First woman, who is Susan Isaacs, telling Marcy, um, excuse me, you can't just walk into a Jefferson Darcy class. Are you on the list? Well, no, but I'm his wife. Then Sonia, the big fat black woman. Oh, nice try, sweetie. We have, okay, okay, we have a, okay, we have a couple of wives and even, uh, okay, we uh, have a couple of wives and a few husbands come uh, in and pose. Okay. Every day we've uh, had a couple of people posing as a husband and even a couple of wi wives. Well, maybe if they give up your spots, they all fit. You better just be glad that I'm weak from dieting. Then Jefferson comes up on stage. All right, guys, Jefferson. Jefferson, Jefferson. All right, ladies, are you guys ready to get hot and bothered? Jefferson, hi. Okay, hey, hey, Marcy, nice to see you. Okay, reach for the eyes, guys, and let's get, roll. Da, 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 da. Marcy's trying to get up to the stage, but this but, uh, Betty, the big fat black woman, she's basically blocking Marcy. She won't. Marcy turns back to Peggy. She won't let me through. Hey, Marcy, I have a secret weapon. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Let's try that again, shall we? <laughs> she won't let me through. Hey, Marcy, I have a secret weapon. Oops, my Snickers slipped. <laughs> okay, so Betty goes looking up in the air, 
and then she goes running after the Snickers bar and when she sees it landing. And then Marcy goes running up on stage, working out with Jefferson. Oh, Marcy, thank you for so much for giving me this job. I'll be happy to pay you back in no time. Well, you don't have to pay me back. Consider it a birthday present. It's Jeffy's birthday. Spanky machine. <laughs> so the, the ladies, they find out that it's Jefferson's birthday, and they decide to um, basically do, uh, get, they all get in line. Jefferson crawls right under them while they sp while each one of them spanks his ass as he's crawling down the line, and then Marcy stops the parade. Oh, Jefferson, I hate to see you sweating a job you hate. She pushes all the women down in the domino effect. And then one of the um, um, ladies that was in the instructor's class goes up to Jefferson. Hey, Jefferson, can you massage my cramp one more time, please? And then Marcy scares her away. I'll give you a cramp. Jefferson. I want you to quit your job. Why, Marcy? If I keep working out here, I'll have the body that you've always wanted. Always wanted? Jefferson, I love you who you are. The reason I sent you to a health club is because I felt that you, I thought that you were so insecure about yourself. And basically, the truth comes out, and basically, uh, Marcy will not, uh, Marcy has Jefferson, all right? She loves him very much, and she will not give him up. And and Marcy, just as much as Jefferson, will not give Marcy up. Okay. Meanwhile, <laughs> Peggy's found an instructor for herself. Instead, but instead of teaching her how to exercise, he's stuffing bonbons down her mouth. I found. <laughs> I've always wanted my own personal trainer. Back back at the shoe store, uh, which is where we're going to finish up the episode, uh, we uh, basically see there's got to be at least seven or eight women outside the shoe store trying to come in, and basically um, they're all excited for Griff. All right. Now Al, of course, is pissed off because he got fired from doing the commercial. The commercial has pretty much aired and has attracted some lovely customers. Okay. And apparently they love they love Griff, they loved Griff so much that they they're um they're here to um they're here to serve they're here to see Griff and to also buy some shoes for him or is what we think. He goes to open up the doors and they all go after him. He asks for Al's help, and but basically no, yeah, they're all yours, buddy. <laughs> And then they go after Griff, and then they go. They basically grab something out, out, out of Griff that they weren't supposed to, because he screams, "Hey, hey, that is not for sale!" And then we wind up going to commercial break, and then we go to the epilogue. In the epilogue, we see they, the, we see Al and Griff have finally built a house out of shoe boxes, perfectly built, not torn down. And they basically, we basically see these two lit midgets, or little people, whatever you want to call it, coming out of the shoe house. We'll take it! And apparently the guy, uh, he recognized Griff from the, produ from the high school production of The Wiz. Hey, were you Glenda in The Wiz? Of the, in, were you Gl in, in the high school production of The Wiz? Yes, I was. I was the mayor of Munchkin Land! All right, <laughs> and that is the end of the episode. All right, so why don't we um, couple of notes here? Now, basically, this is the Mary Children had done a, a handful. Of, Mary Children had done a handful of birthday episodes throughout the show's run, and this is the last one that we're going to see. Okay, uh, the title of the episode is a play on the terms "birthday boy." referring to a male, regardless of age, celebrating his birthday, and boy toy, which refers to a young man who is used by older women purely for sexual gratification. It is revealed that Jefferson turns 40 years old in this episode, and although Jefferson is portrayed to be several years younger than Marcy, in real life their actors Amanda Beers and Ted McGinley 
are exactly the same age. Okay. So a few co uh, a few cultural references here. Um, Peggy uses the Don Knotts hologram to distract Kelly at the beginning of the episode. Uh, Kelly then admires it as it alternates between an image of Mr. Furley and Barney Fife. Don Knotts was an actor and comedian whose most notable acting roles included the goofy landlord Ralph Furley on Three's Company and Deputy Barney Fife on The Andy Griffith Show. So it was uh, Don Knotts in his two most infamous roles from Three's Company and Andy Griffith. Griff tells the kids that he played Dorothy in The Wiz, a retelling of the wonderful Wizard of Oz through a contemporary African-American culture. Later, Griff seems ease on down the road from The Wiz as he prepares to be in the commercial that Bud and Fe Kelly are filming. After Al complains about Peggy's shopping habits, she gives Al a Ginger Mary Ann hologram to distract him like she did with Kelly. Ginger and Mary Ann are references to the characters Ginger Grant and Marianne Summers from the 1960s sitcom Gilligan's Island. Tina Louise, who played Ginger Grant, had previously appeared on Married Children as Miss Beck. And I think that's when the, I think she was uh, Kelly's instructor in Kelly's Gotta Bounce. The new Alante! Okay. Al mentions the dining restaurant chain IHOP, which stands for International House of Pancakes, and their Rudy Tootie fresh and fruity breakfast meals. Okay, Cliff Bemis, who played Al's father a few episodes earlier, also plays the spokesman for IHOP in their commercials around the time that this episode originally aired. And for those of you who are not familiar with IHOP, um, it's a diner-style restaurant. Right? with the primary focus on breakfast food. It has over 1,800 locations across the United States as well as parts of Canada, Mexico, South America, and the Middle East. Most are open 24 hours a day, although some have set hours when required by law. It is primar known primarily for its pancake platters, although they offer standard dial-style diner-style foods such as hamburgers, steak, and chicken tenders. Uh, it is similar to another real-life restaurant mentioned on Married Children, known as Denny's. One of its most uh, known breakfast plates is the Rudy Tootie Fresh and Fruity, which consists of bacon, sausage, eggs, hash browns, and a choice of fruit covered pancake shared by a similar style of Denny's Grand Slam. Cliff Bemis was, uh, was a spokesman for IHOP from 1992 to 2002, appeared in their television and radio ads as the character Cliff and his brother Biff, telling viewers about the variety of food served at the restaurants. All right. It is referenced in a wide variety of episodes of Married Children, including The Mystery of Skull Island, A Little Off the Top, Al, Love Conquers Al, uh, Crimes Against Obesity, and Birthday Boy Toys, so a total of five episodes. Okay. Jefferson mentions that one of the sexual games that he and Marcy play is Hop on Pop. It is the name of a children's book by Dr. Seuss. It's, it's about 64 pages long. And basically it says like, Hop. Pop. We like to hop. We like to hop on top of Pop. Stop! You must not hop on Pop. <laughs> Probably my most favorite part of the whole thing. Like you basically have one word and two words. You have okay. You have like one word and you have another word that rhymes with, the, with that. And then you have some kind of like verbal phrase, stuff like that. Hop, pop. We like to hop. We like to hop on top of pop. <laughs> At one point, Peggy tries to buy a locket with um, the chest hair of British singer Tom Jones. As the announcer mentions that the locket has Jones's real chest hair, ew, that's disgusting. Peggy says, "Well, that's not well. It's not that unusual," alluding to one of the most famous songs. It's not unusual. 
okay? Uh, that's uh, talk a little bit about Tom Jones, okay? So Tom Jones, still alive today, born June 7th, 1940, is known... Pr he was originally born as Sir... Like he's, his official name is Sir Thomas Jones Woodward, but he goes by Tom Jones as uh, professionally. He is a Welsh singer, originally born from originally born in Wales, which is part of the United Kingdom. His career began with a string of top ten hits in the mid 1960s. He toured regularly, but had um, appearances in Las Vegas from 1967 through 2011. Jones's voice has been described as all music, or by all music as full-throated, robust baritone, okay? So basically he has a, a wide variety of range uh, of music from R&B, show tunes, country, dance, soul, and gospel, just to name a few. 2008, New York Times called Jones a musical shapeshifter who could slide from soulful raps to pop croon with a voice as husky as it is pretty. He has sold over 100 million records, with 36 top 40 hits in the United Kingdom and 19 in the United States, including but not limited to It's Not Unusual, What's New Pussycat, the theme song for the 1965 James Bond film Thunderball, as well as Green Green Grass of Home, Delilah, She's a Lady, Kiss, and Sex Bomb. All right? It's not unusual. That's probably her... It, his Not Unusual is probably his most popular song ever. And it was also used, along with an appearance of Tom Jones himself, in the 1996 film Mars Attacks. The Martians, they come and they attack all over the Earth, and they show a clip in Vegas. Tom Jones is appearing on stage, and apparently his band got um, exterminated by a bunch of aliens so you have Tom Jones sitting on stage and then right behind him is a bunch of aliens that are trying to dance in disguise it. what the hell <laughs> and then they try to take out Tom Jones but he miraculously survives meanwhile he's singing the song it's not unusual but my most favorite song that he has done is she's a lady whoa 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 she's a lady Talking about that little lady. And that lady is mine. <laughs> Don't ask me to sing any more of that. It sucks. <laughs> really, I think it sucks. All right. Well, we already talked about... Hey, what a coincidence. That was the next thing on this list here. But enough of Tom Jones. All right. One last thing we're going to talk about is... Uh, as Bud fires Al and belittles him, at one point he tells his dad, "Your must flee TV. It's a reference to NBC's advertising slogan for its Thursday night primetime programming, Must See TV. This included Friends as the, show, as the leading show and also included Seinfeld and Frasier, just to name a few others. And one of the other shows that, believe it or not, was also part of that Must See TV lineup was a show called Jesse." featuring Christina Applegate, a show to which she had done for two seasons after Married Children had come to an end. And one thing I'd like to add, um, the show Jesse is set in my native town of Buffalo, New York. All right? And you have Eric Lloyd, who plays um, little boy Charlie in the Santa Claus with Tim Allen. He play, I mean, He plays... Um, Christina Applegate's son in Jesse, okay? And one f clip I... <laughs> Basically, um, Eric, he gets... Um, he has to stay at home. He's being babysat by two of Jesse's friends. And basically, they're trying to uh, tell him some story. He wants to know what sex is, but they're trying to distract him. What's that have to do with sex? So then they go into this bag of candy, and they, hey, I have a Snickers bar. Yeah! Now sex, sex, sex! <laughs> I want to thank you wait till, uh, I think you wait till your mother uh, comes home to talk about that. No, I want to hear from somebody who's actually done it! 
right. You know that it. You know, I think that's some. That's an idea. I think that's something that the Married Children podcast should review. After they're done with Married Children, they should review Jesse. All right. I would be up for that. All right. So that's all we have for that. Uh, here are. So now we're going to go into my review for Birthday Boy Toy. So, um, you can tell the show's um coming to an end. All right. The, the quality's starting to die off. Um, overall, I personally thought it was a good episode. Um, my favorite part of the whole episode would probably have to be. Oops, my Snickers slipped. <laughs> the, 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 when that lady goes looking up in the air for that Snickers bar and goes running after it, I that is something I have always. I've watched this episode for 20 years, and I laugh my ass off every time I see that clip. It is one of my favorite clips of the entire 11th season, all right? So, like, I like it pretty much, all right? Um, the shoe store commercial, I thought was okay, all right? I can't question about that. Um, I would have loved, one thing I would have loved to see, I would have loved to see the final product, all right? That's one thing I wish I would have seen. Um, Jefferson, uh, not being being insecure and Peggy not being able to shop. Well, those I uh, thought pretty interesting. Okay. So um, coming into a rain here, I um, I think I'm thinking of two different ratings for this one, and it's hard to pick which one. But for birthday boy toy I will probably give it a three and a half out of five all right I'm not gonna go any higher than that okay uh, B plot a little bit a little better than the uh, that shitty B plot from life new peg we saw two weeks ago I liked it okay it was okay I, I liked it but there's some stuff I would have done differently um, I would have liked to have seen an actual birthday party for Jefferson, but other than that, I don't see. I don't have much else to complain about. Um, so I will stand by the three and a half on that. Okay. Uh, there's a few more episodes coming up. I'm there's um the Dan Bundy's and uh, lesbian friends. They're pretty good. Epi- okay. I think those are the la- those are the last of the good episodes the ones that will get decent right okay so that's why i'm i'm giving that's why i'm being generous for birthday boy toy because we have some very bad episodes coming up and i like to share i like to save those for later on okay so that is my um review in a nutshell for birthday boy toy i want to thank um Okay, I want to wish all of you in the U.S. a happy Thanksgiving. I know you guys have something to be thankful for. So I'm, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful for um, the workplace I work for. I'm very thankful to have had the honors of being a guest host on five episodes of the Mary Children Podcast over the past year. And although I probably, although I won't be back on there again because the show has come to an end, I'll probably be contributing something for the series wrap-up show, which will likely come up in January. In addition to that, um, I'm very thankful for uh, all all the support that you guys have given me here. Okay, I have, uh, and very thankful for all of you guys uh, who are listening to my videos. Okay, so at least um, we have an, we're starting to build an audience here. Okay. Since I've started, my subscribers have d- at least doubled, if not tripled. Uh, we're up to 60 subscribers. I know that's not a lot, but it's we're shooting up from what we did when we first started. And I know that some of the people on the Married Children podcast are subscribers. 
I know that some of my coworkers are subscribers and friends. And uh, for those of you who are uh, listening to me every week, those of you hitting the like buttons, we appreciate your generosity. I know there's a couple of videos out there that um, they're getting some really huge interest. Like there is one video that does come to mind, which is um, Hot Up the Grill. We did that episode in honor of the 4th of July here in the U.S., and that episode it it got a it got decent it got a good amount of views okay back when we first started up in averaging about 30 views per 30 40 views per video now we're averaging about 50 or so views per video at least hot off the grill we got to about it got anywhere from like, we were almost up to about 100 views for the longest time and then about three weeks ago I don't know who the hell is watching that video or where that video has winded up but the views on that video holy shit we've gone from like a hundred something views up to we are now over 1200 views so like that video has gotten about a thousand to eleven hundred views in just three weeks and for a video for, that's nothing for for some channels that's nothing but for a video for a channel like mine that's through the roof all right and then and then there's um birthday no, no, there's um babe in toyland all right at the time of the, at the time that this episode is being recorded babe in toyland had only been up for about 72 hours if not a little bit longer than that and we're already up to 200 we're almost up to 200 views which is unheard of for a video that i just loaded okay some of my highest rated videos are well we have hot the grill we have banking on marcy we have um al loses his cherry that one got a huge boost in the view count because i reviewed that when rich schneider who played luke ventura in the first season of Married Children, when he did an interview with the Married Children podcast, and I reviewed that episode in honor of Luke Ventura's interview, and that one shot up pretty quickly. Now it's starting to pick up momentum. Um, and I'm pretty sure this video, I would not be surprised if it were to shoot up, boost up in views. All right. So if you guys are, um, I, um, do plan on reviewing the remainder of season 11, so we do have a few more episodes to go on that. And then after that, I do plan on reviewing additional classic episodes from the first 10 seasons. Um, I do plan, with Christmas only a couple weeks away, I will be uh, about five weeks away f from the time from the time I'm recording this. Uh, we basically, um, I plan on um reviewing all of the christmas episodes so we have you better watch out from season two we have that two-parter it's a wonderful life from season three we have christmas from season seven worst noel from season eight and i can't believe it's butter from season 10 and you're one what about god rest the mary bundyman well that episode i've already reviewed all right because that fell in the same contraction as the marriage show we did that at the same time the Marriage Children Podcast reviewed it, so that's already done. But I'll review the other episodes, okay? And outside of that, I won't be reviewing, I most likely won't be reviewing any more classic episodes until after the new year. But if there's any particular episodes you would like me to review from the first 10 seasons that I have not touched yet, let me know in the comments below, because I um, want to hear from you guys, okay? Oh, and by the way, if any of you guys are wondering, right, if any of you guys are able to provide me an explanation with why my review for Hot Off the Grill is shoot, is averaging 80 to 100 views a day, uh, which is uh, my highest rated review of Married Children, let me know because I'm trying to figure that out for myself. Okay? But until the next time we meet, I'm Mr. Wildcat reminding you, wishing you all a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll be back next week with Damn Bundies. And until we meet again, I'm Mr. Wildcat reminding each and every one of you to be good, be careful, and behave. Oops, my Snickers slipped. <laughs>